Thank you, Lisa, for inviting me back. Uh, it's been a little while. I think it was two years ago, Boston, when I spoke here um, before in, in the venue. Um, haven't done your, your event here in Silicon Valley before, but uh, I'm happy to say it's just as good as the one I saw in Boston. So you've done a great job cultivating a good community of people here. Um, so I'm excited to, you know, we haven't uh, taken too many chances to talk about our BCI work from Facebook. Um, and so it's exciting to be here in this venue, get to know a few of you, and get, give you a better sense of what we've been up to. <clears throat> um, so uh, for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Mark Chevalet. I'm a research director uh, at Facebook Reality Labs. Um, and that's where I run the Brain Computer Interface program. Uh, if you're not familiar with Facebook Reality Labs, it's a research and development team inside of Facebook that's focused on uh, augmented reality and virtual reality technologies. And the reason for that interest is uh, looking at these technologies as sort of the next generation uh, personal computing platform after the smartphone. Probably don't have to explain that to this, to this crowd here. Um, and so there are plenty of technical challenges that are gonna need to be overcome along the way to AR glasses. They are a very difficult technical challenge in and of themselves, but probably one of the hardest challenges that we'll face is figuring out how to interact with these things as you're walking around, going about your daily life, talking to other people. Because what we don't want is for people to have to choose between staying connected to their friends and family when they're far away and interacting with the world around them. Ideally, we'd like to be able to have both. And so that means we have to get creative about what types of interface uh, designs we're gonna consider, and we may have to pursue some high-risk, uh, high high-reward type venues for that. Um, because part of the challenge is the interface that we still use in our current personal computing paradigm was designed to be used while working at a desk. Right? This is largely the interface that we still use. It wasn't designed for walking around, living your life, talking to other people. And so this is one of the core challenges that we'll face, um, is trying to figure out what is the right interface that makes a lot of sense for these AR glasses. And that's what brings us to, to brain-computer interface and our interest in this area, um, knowing this is a high-risk, high-reward type of, of pursuit. Um, you know, I got my grounding in brain-computer interface before I came to FRL. Actually, in my graduate studies, I worked a bit in BCI. After graduate school, I went to uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. While I was there, for a long time, they had been working with DARPA on a project called uh, Revolutionizing Prosthetics. And this program was focused on completely replacing the limb of a, of a soldier who had had to have an amputation. So that meant the robotics to actually create the end effector, and it also meant the neural interface so that you can control that arm and feel proprioception from that arm uh, and, and somatosensation from that arm just as though it were the natural limb. This is an amazing program that I was really, really happy to be close to. Although that was what drew me to APL, I never actually worked on the program because this was their, their first foray into neuroscience, and what they realized was there was an opportunity to expand where they were working in applied neuroscience. So I largely spent my, my time at APL for about five years helping them expand their portfolio of work in applied neuroscience. This was largely in brain-computer interface, of course, different types of applications there. Um, another area we called neural computing, basically AI, neural-inspired uh, neural algorithms. And then in what we called uh, cognitive performance, so applied cognitive science. So I got a good broad grounding in those different technologies. Um, while I was there at APL, I also got a chance to collaborate with Nathan Crone and his group up at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and they had been working on motor prosthetics, and we kind of got together with an idea to collaborate to take some of those same ideas from the motor prosthetics and try to create communications prosthetics for people who couldn't speak. So I got a little more exposure to what was possible there, um, you know, during this time, I got to see people use brain-computer interfaces to feed themselves, to give high fives, fist bumps, uh, even to fly a jet simulator. Um, and these were just amazing demonstrations of the technology. The limitation, of course, is that all of this was possible only using implanted electrodes. And so it's only really viable in clinical use cases, and even then for very small populations of people. So one of the other things that I did while I was at APL was to, to explore with DARPA and a few other sponsors whether it would be possible to get more of the functionality that we've come to expect from implanted electrodes, maybe not all of it, but more of it, using a completely non-invasive approach. And I mean completely non-invasive, nothing swallowed, no, no injecting any tracers, nothing like that, completely wearable device. And that's, a, that's asking a lot. We never thought we'd get to single neuron resolution or anything like that, but could we get closer to what we expect out of these implanted electrode arrays? 
So I had been exploring that space, and that's right about the time that I was recruited to Facebook. Um, yes, I had probably the same response that you're having, Facebook. Um, but they've been, they had been developing a really incredible technology program, really developing an awful lot of expertise in hardware, um, AI, compute. So it actually made an awful lot more sense than it seemed at the beginning. Um, you know, I was also surprised that when I arrived, I had sort of assumed that I'd be asked to land an EEG feature in 18 months in a product. But uh, to my surprise, what I was really asked to do is to define a, what would be an aggressive, ambitious research program that would really push forward the state of the art in brain computer interface. They knew that brain computer interface was going to be an interesting, high potential technology, but not exactly what for or how exactly it would work yet. So how would we advance that technology potentially over 10 years? Um, so I knew a couple of things at that point. Number one, I knew I chose the right place, which was great. Um, and number two, I, I put together that the work that I'd been doing uh, thinking about communications prosthetics and non-invasive interfaces we had originally only been thinking about that for use cases of, of people with disabilities and speech uh, limitations, but it occurred to me that this same technology could potentially be useful for, for you and I or anybody, because we currently do use our voice interfaces. You've probably all used uh, Siri or Hey Google, whatever. Um, you've used these devices out. You probably have used it in the car. You've probably used it when you're at home. You probably don't use it in public, and I doubt anybody uses it at work. And so people do have an aversion to using the voice interface in front of other people, even though we know it has an advantage because we use it in the car and we use it at home. So there was a value proposition there for brain-computer interface um, that made it relevant to consumer electronics. And so that's what I pursued when I first got there. Um, so today I'm going to talk you a little bit through what it was that we actually proposed um, and what the approach is knowing that this is a long-term ambitious research program that's probably going to take about 10 years. We described it here in this blog post uh, that we published last summer, um, and there's a lot of detail in it, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to sort of talk people through what it was that we said there. I'll also give you a little look forward at where we're going and, and where we stand today and how far we've come. Um, but before we start talking about that, um, I just want to talk about how technology you know, we understand, we appreciate that technology is never really neutral. It's situated within a specific context in history and within society and, and the forces that are sort of working around us. And right now, the context for neurotech, that context for neurotechnology is that over the last you know, decade, but really, really even just the last six years, neurotechnologies and neuroscience have seen some pretty dramatic revolutions in terms of what's possible. This is in part because of some concentrated, and in some cases coordinated, investments by multiple governments around the world. And so there's been a lot of focus on neurotechnologies, there's been a lot of investment, and so there's been a lot of progress, and what that means is that society's understanding of what's possible, and their thinking about what that might mean for, for you and me, is going to take some time to catch up. So the field of neuroethics is still developing, and we're well aware of this. It's one of the reasons that I'm here talking to you today. It's one of the reasons we've chosen to be as transparent as we're being about our BCI work, because we want it to be part of that public narrative. We know that we can't answer all of the ethical questions that are going to come up about the use of these technologies, both good and bad, what the risks will be, what the benefits will be. That conversation should happen out here in the community and in society. And so we can't have that conversation if you don't know what's possible. And so that's a big reason why I'm here today. All right, with all that said, with that context in mind, um, I want to talk about the first thing we needed to know uh, to determine whether a silent speech interface was going to be possible is whether speech could be decoded from neural activity at all using any sort of interface. And as I mentioned before, this can only really be done using implanted electrodes today. I'll be clear that we have no interest in building a product that's going to require implanted electrodes, right? We're not involved in medical business. We're not looking for clinical applications. But we did study some, uh, or sponsor some studies at UCSF where uh, Eddie Chang's group is a, Eddie Chang is a, is a world-class neurosurgeon and he has a really fantastic research team there that, have, that do really wonderful studies with uh, patients as they're undergoing surgery for epilepsy. I think a lot of people in the room are familiar with this model. And during those studies, they were able to work on uh, work on the problem whether it was possible to decode single words in, in short phrases from the neural activity that they recorded from these implanted electrode arrays. And they published some of their first results 
uh, this summer in Nature Communications, it's a really wonderful paper um, by David Moses, pictured here uh, with Eddie. And this was, this was showing their results that they could, in real time, decode single words and small phrases. These were answers to questions that the, the patient was being asked. Um, the real key part here is the real time. So it had actually been known that you could decode single words or even phrases from this neural activity, but all the processing had been done offline after the fact. Um, so this was really the first demonstration that this could all be done real time and that you could make it interactive. They, um, UCSF went on to publish this great blog post uh, in the summer accompanying the Nature Communications paper as well, where they explained the bigger picture for them and their greater research program even beyond what we've been supporting. And in that greater program, they're really interested, the UCSF is, has been interested in building a communications prosthetic for a very long time. And so they have started a clinical trial called BRAVO. I'm going to forget what that acronym means. But, um, and in that study, they're using these electrodes to try to restore movement and communication in patients who have severe disability due to brain injuries. As part of that study, we're, we're funding one individual additional study in which a participant has elected to have these electrodes implanted long term. This individual has both communication and movement uh, limitations. And in that study, UCSF is exploring whether or not it will be possible to decode speech in real time a little more continuously and see if that participant can actually get some communication value out of the interface. So that study is too, uh, it's ongoing. It's too early sta uh, stage to be able to say anything about it, but I'm hoping that they'll have results to share in the near future. We're really excited to see those. So with that all in mind, we're pretty confident now that it is going to be possible to build a silent speech interface. We do think it's possible to, de to decode speech from neural signals. But as I mentioned, we're not interested in anything involving implants. So we have some hard work to do on our side to figure out how we're gonna do the same thing using a completely non-invasive interface. And to do that, we're focused on infrared imaging technologies. So I'm gonna tell you what that approach is and where I think we need to go. Um, to warn you, it might be a little bit boring. It actually is pretty straightforward in terms of the research path that's already out there in the literature. You just may not have, may not have realized it. Uh, but to start, I want to make sure we all understand how this works. And uh, I'll start by just explaining how a pulse, pulse oximeter works. This pulse oximeter, you've probably had it put on your finger when you were at, uh, at the doctor's office. Many people have talked about this technology today. The way that it works is that it shines infrared light through your finger, right? And photons go through your finger, and they're detected as they come out the other end. And the, depending on the level of oxygen in your blood, different numbers of photons will be absorbed. The, the blood literally changes colors, right? So that changes the number of photons that are absorbed as they go through, and that allows doctors to tell how much oxygen is in your blood. This device doesn't look like a pulse oximeter, but it's basically the same thing. This is a diffuse optical tomography system built by our collaborators in Joe Culver's lab at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, they've been great collaborators that have been doing some really great work. They built this system as part of our collaboration. And it works the same as that pulse oximeter that I just mentioned. It's just that now there's a lot more channels, there's a lot more sources, a lot more detectors, and now they happen to be on the head instead of on the finger. But you're still sending infrared photons through the tissue, detecting what comes out, and inferring the oxygen levels. Um, so using this approach, it lets us measure oxygen levels which indirectly lets us measure neural activity because neurons use up a bunch of oxygen when they're active. So this is how we can indirectly sense brain activity. And Joe's group has done some great, uh, great work showing with these systems that they can get brain activity while people are uh, looking at visual stimulation, while they're reading, maybe even silently speaking to themselves. So this is all interesting and useful uh, information for us. Now, you're probably looking at this system, or you should be looking at this system, and, say, and then thinking about the name of this conference being wearable tech and saying, Mark, that's, that's not exactly wearable. Um, I would agree, you'd be right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but if you look under the hood, um, you know, the first thing that you see, if, you, if we take these boxes out of the rack that they have and we look under the hood, the first thing we see is a bunch of air. That's easy to get rid of. The next thing you see is a bunch of hardware, and of the hardware that is there, there's actually, thanks to, the, thanks to the thriving consumer photonics industry, there's actually pretty good equivalents available in the consumer grade kits. And so what, uh, by looking at this and evaluating it, we, we figured out that we could replace $5,000 worth of laser diodes 
with a $10 Vixel array from our friends here at Vixar. And 28 uh, Avalanche photo detectors cost us about $11,000, and we realized we could replace that with a, a $10 CMOS detector. Now, this would, this would not be very impressive if I said, well, you can create a DOT system, right, out of consumer grade parts. This, the design that we undertook was meant to hit the same sensitivity spe specification as that full-size system, right? So we expect to be able to get the same capability of the refrigerator size device in a small and portable device. Here's our, uh, our first prototype where we took this approach. So you can see how it works because it's all opened up here. You can see at the top, does my laser pointer work? There we go. Uh, at the top, you have the, the Vixels that are sending the light down through these different, um, these different fiber runs here. You can see we turn on one source at a time. We record from all the detectors at the same time. The camera is over here, but you can see these detector channels running over to it, and we just image the, the CMOS array. And by recording from all the channels simultaneously, we get a large number of measurements that we can average together, which helps us improve the signal to noise quality. Uh, so then we, we iterated on this again. We, we customized some of the electronics so we could reduce them in size. Uh, we shifted the weight around so it was redistributed over the head a little bit more comfortably. And that's how we came up with the research kit that we showed in our blog uh, last summer. So we never really explained how that worked. This is now you know how it works. Um, these devices right now, we've been, we've been building up the software so that we can get the data off of these systems in the meantime. We've been testing them to see, as I said, they were designed to hit the same sensitivity spec as the big device. Right now we're trying to run those studies to see if we can confirm are we actually getting the same sensitivity from those devices. All right, so that's where we stand today. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about where we're going, but before we do that, I just wanna talk a little bit more about how these measurements are actually made, what they mean. And so when we make a measurement uh, using this approach, there we go. Um, as I mentioned, there, when neurons are active, they consume oxygen from the vasculature, and it's by measuring the number of photons that are absorbed as they, as they travel through this tissue that we're able to infer those oxygen levels. And <clears throat> that signal is called the hemodynamic response. And it peaks, it peaks at about five seconds after the stimulus. This leads most people to say that this response is slow or sluggish, right? And that this could never be used for BCI because it's slow. Well, I'm gonna argue against that because um, if we could observe the hemodynamic response perfectly, then you could detect arbitrarily early, right? So it's not a matter so much of the time course of the response, it has more to do with the robustness of the detection. Now, of course, we never perfectly observe the hemodynamic response. What we observe is an intensity measurement made off of our optical device. And that net measurement inherently has noise, right? And it's because of that noise that we have to wait until the biggest part of the signal to get reliable detection, where we've reliably departed from baseline. So the trick here isn't to find some other signal necessarily, it's to drive up our signal and drive down our noise. So that's a big part of what we're doing. The current generation systems that I showed you before, we're working on optimizing the signal to noise there by doing things like uh, trying to make the collection fibers as big as possible so you can collect as many photons as possible because that directly correlates to signal trying to swap in lower noise detectors so we can re reduce that noise floor. And actually a massive source of noise is movement. Movement not being walking around, but it's relative movement to the outside world because as you saw in that system, there are these big glass fibers that are reaching out from the world and connecting to your head and th they're touching your head, they're not connecting to your head. They're, when they're touching your head, and so if you move your head a little bit, you get a lot of relative motion and you actually break the contact with the scalp, and that induces huge motion artifacts. So by miniaturizing everything and putting the whole set of electronics right on your head, you have none of those relative motion artifacts, and now you should drive up your signal and also be able to move around with this thing. We know that we're gonna have to be able to walk around with it at some point. So that's what we've been doing in our current systems. Now, Thinking about moving forward and remembering that our goal here is optimizing signal to noise ratio, there's another thing that we can do that comes out of the literature, it's called a time domain approach. And in this approach, instead of continuously illuminating, what we do is we send in a short little pulse of light. And when that pulse of light contacts the scalp, 
it's going to scatter, and all the photons in that pulse are going to branch out, they're gonna scatter around and take different paths through the tissue as they travel to the, detec to the detector. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the photons that travel only through the scalp and the skull will have taken the shortest path. And so they'll arrive at the detector the earliest. Because they only went through scalp and skull, this is noise. We don't care about it, right? So we wanna throw it away. Actually, we don't throw it away. I'll come back to that in a second. We regress it out. Um, the next thing is that the, the photons that take a longer path and went down through the actual brain tissue, they will have taken a longer path and therefore they'll show up later at the detector. So these late photons contain the signal that we care about, we wanna keep those. Those are our signal. So we don't hold on to those and what we do is we take those early photons and actually regress them out of the, long, of the late ones. Um, so I say that we're doing this, we're just getting our hands dirty with this now. This is all looks great on paper, we wanna see if it holds up in practice. So of course we've, we've built one of these time domain systems. Here's the, the team having a little bit too much fun showing off their hardware. Um, and they're really excited to get data off of this device. We hope to have some results to report out uh, later this year. Now, there's one more thing that we can do to try to increase the signal to noise ratio, and that's to make use of a different source of contrast. Everything I've talked about up to this point is based on absorption measurements, right? Absorption due to oxygenation. But <clears throat> if you shine a, light, a laser through a, a diffusive medium here, like brain tissue, uh, the light gets scattered and what you end up with is a so-called speckle pattern, right? The light interferes with itself in different little ways and makes this speckle pattern. And that speckle pattern is affected by any motion happening inside the medium that it's moving through. And so we think that this speckle pattern will actually give us information about not oxygenation, but movement, but motion of the tissue itself inside the medium. Um, this approach is called diffuse correlation spectroscopy. And it's where you look at one of those little speckles and you look at how well correlated it is with itself over time. Now, the problem with today's DCS systems is that they can only observe one speckle at a time. So we're on this, this line right here. And there's a safety limit, right? We can only turn up the, the optical gain, we can only put in so many photons before you start heating up the tissue and it's not safe anymore. So we have to stay within that safety limit and so you can see we just can't get to very high signal to noise ratio with just one speckle. But if you average over lots of speckle, you measure lots of speckle and you average over them, you can increase your signal to noise ratio here. And you can see you can get pretty good gain out of this. Uh, just by going to 1,000 speckle, we think we could get about 30 times higher SNR. And if that was true, then we expect that relationship to continue to hold and you can continue to drive the signal to noise ratio higher as the number of pixels on these devices continued to increase. And so as it turns out, you can buy a, a camera off the shelf today that has a thousand pixels worth of detectors that, can, that are fast enough to, and sensitive enough to measure these speckle. Uh, so this is a, a camera from a company called Photon Force. It's 32 by 32 pixels of uh, what's called SPAD, single photon, single photon avalanche diodes. And so we took one of these cameras to try to verify this, and instead of using a brain tissue, before we get to brains, we put a diffuser in front of it. You can think of it here as a sugar cube. We shine a light through, we, sh uh, we, we um, capture the speckle field on this SPAD camera, and what we should see is that changing speckle pattern as we move the diffuser, as I mentioned before. And so when we do that experiment, sure enough, we do start to see these speckle patterns show up on the camera, these are actual measured data from those devices. And we're continuing to work right now to verify, are we getting that actual 30 times improvement in signal to noise ratio that we predicted? Hopefully later this year, we'll be able to report out on, on what we find. And in the meantime, uh, an important part that I wanted to bake into the program from the get-go was a, a holistic or integrative approach. So I always wanna move these systems into experiments in, the, in, in real life, in a human system, as soon as is practicable, right? I don't wanna say as fast as possible, but we need to make sure that the devices are safe, we get our IRB approvals in place, and then I wanna get into a human system where it makes sense so that we can see how the system, the system including the human, actually works. And so this is that same camera-based device um, 
running, we have a, a laser source that's coming through one of these fibers, the other fiber is a detector, and the end of that fiber is running down to one of those cameras that I mentioned before. And what you can see here, this is that correlation that I mentioned before, that speckle field will, will be really well correlated the slower things are moving, and the faster things move, the, the, the faster the speckle field will decorrelate. And so what you can see quite clearly here is the pulse. You can see it stays nice and long for a while, and then with the pulse it keeps dropping down, and you get faster decorrelations. So this is a very nice, clean signal. It's, it's, it's typically pretty hard to just see this pulsation uh, using a DCS system these days. Um, so we're getting very nice signal. We're able to do this all in real time, which we think will help drive the, the innovation forward. Again, we're, we're eager to make some more progress here, and hopefully um, in the next year or so, we'll, we'll hope to have more results to, to, uh, to present. All right, with that, you've got a pretty good sense of what it is that we're trying to do and where we stand. Um, and the direction that we're taking. Um, I hope it's been interesting. I hope it's been helpful. Um, just to, to wrap up here, um, to be clear, we don't expect our BCI devices that I've been showing you to solve the problem of AR input anytime real soon. Right? You see where they stand today. We know that this is an ambitious, long-term, probably 10-year research program, um, and we're excited to see where it leads. Hopefully, you'll agree that the, the approach is not you know, it's not crazy, there's, a, there's some real science here. This is grounded in the things that we see in the literature. There are new devices and components available from the commercial uh, consumer photonics industry now that are making it possible to, to build and develop all these systems that I think people in the imaging community have known would be valuable for a long time. And now we have access to the parts and the engineering horsepower we need to actually build them and see how far we can drive this forward. So we're certainly not there yet, but we think we see a light at the end of the tunnel and we think we can close the gap. So with that, I'll just say thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I think that leaves us a minute or two for questions. Hey. I'm used to the term f -nears. Yes. So I'm wondering if what you're doing is different, and that's why you didn't use the term? Yeah, so I'm talking about a whole sort of collection of technologies. The starting point that I would, I would say is uh, remember, I talked about the pulse oximeter. If you put one pulse oximeter on the head, you basically have the equivalent of FNIRs, functional near-infrared spectroscopy. Maybe a small number of channels, too. You can measure from, you know, sometimes FNIRs instruments will have eight or ten channels, that sort of thing, but you're basically measuring one source to one detector at a time. In diffuse optical tomography, it's the same thing. You just have many more sources, many more detectors, and in the tomography part of it, you're actually tomographically reconstructing an image based on all the different paths. Think of, uh, of a CT image, computed tomography image. You would do the same thing. Um, and then taking it a step farther, there's, I mentioned those little pulses of light going in and, the, and measuring the early versus the late photons. That would also be within the FNIRS literature, but now called time domain FNIRS. And then the last technique that I talked about was diffuse correlation spectroscopy, which is different than FNIRS. FNIRS is all uh, around making those absorption measurements, and DCS is about making those blood flow measurements. Yep. So it's a whole sort of family of techniques that are interrelated. You get to come up with a new name, right? That's right. <laughs> well, we haven't actually come up with any of these names yet. Like I said, all these techniques are actually out there in the literature. We're just putting them together at a, at a sort of scale that, that they haven't been put together before. You can actually, uh, this will be a talk for a later time, but you can actually combine the two techniques as well um, and get time domain diffuse correlation spectroscopy, which has an awful lot of promise as well. It, it needs a new anagram. And what? And we'll need a new anagram. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, the, the technique is out there. Uh, it's, MGH has been pursuing this. Uh, Maria Angela Franceschini has, has been pushing this forward for a while, and she does call it TDDCS, but maybe we'll come up with something a little flashier. <laughs>